Good evening. Welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to be back here at SAIST once again and uh, to have our partners here. And uh, most importantly, to have with us uh, Mary Robinson, uh, whom you all know. Uh, one thing about Mary is that the more her CV expands and looks more and more awesome, the more bored she gets if you start saying it. <laughs> so the only thing that I'm allowed to say about her that it was, she was the first president of Ireland and that now she is uh, the uh, elders uh, chief chair. I was going to say chief. It sounds more impressive to be, <laughs> to be chief of the elders, especially who the elders are, you know. They're heads of state and, and very, very uh, extraordinary people. Uh, but uh, I have, uh, of course, had the privilege and the honor and the, to work with Mary for over two decades. And uh, we've been through a lot of interesting projects. And so when about a year and a half ago, she uh, asked me, uh, you know, uh, more about uh, Women's Learning Partnership, and we started talking, she said she is willing to give us two years uh, to support Women's Learning Partnership. And I said, wow, you know, that's amazing, extraordinary. She said, however, I know what you guys do, and I'm very much supportive of it. And uh, I, I started saying even more about how uh, extraordinary the partnership is and what it's doing and so forth. And uh, repeated again that we have now become 20 partners uh, starting from uh, the beginning of uh, January 2000 uh, being the first international organization uh, in uh, the 21st century and starting with only two languages and five partners and growing to 20 and finding our focus at Beijing. Now we have expanded even more. And of course, uh, the growth from Beijing, she knew very well, was based on the experience of, of, of the conference in Beijing itself, where some over 180 governments and over 35,000 uh, individuals and activists representing um, hundreds of organizations had gathered. And there we had, uh, some of us who were present there had come to see what is happening and what is that to be the value added of a new organization. And thinking at all that we're, people were doing from violence to legal legislative change to all sorts of other areas of uh, endeavor that people had undertaken, we decided that, you know, the problem was more than these areas of, of uh, focus and expertise. That the problems that we all had, not just women, but men and women, were really uh, focused on the way we related to each other, the top-down, patriarchal, uh, uh, sort of uh, authoritarian division of labor and uh, division of uh, the goods of this world and the rights, this simply was something that was not working. That it started at the family level and it grew to uh, communities and to organizations and to nations and internationally and it simply wasn't working anymore. We were building arms that were not necessary. We were having uh, distinctions uh, that were um, completely uh, peripheral uh, to, uh, to who we were. And also, the poverty and inequality was growing. Wars were unnecessary and irrational. So we thought that if we started with changing the leadership uh, of the, in, in, in society, the way people related to each other, starting at the family and, and moving on to, to the different levels, that that would be the way to, do, to change. And actually this had happened. So we had actually grown from five organizations to 20 
partners who are here with, with us tonight, and covering uh, four uh, continents and working in 20 languages. So Mary told me, all oh, that is fine, and the fact that you use uh, sentences like we are there to change the architecture of human relationships, grandiose as it sounds, it's still okay, but all of that will take time. And it has taken decades, it's going to take even more time. What we need right now is to solve the existential problem of climate change. The planet is in danger. The planet will survive but the human race and other living things on it will not survive. So I'm going to do what I said, she said, which was to join you and help you, but help you to help yourself and help our families and help communities in order to save the planet for our children and our grandchildren. So here we are, uh, we have spent the last two days together, planning, uh, looking at initiatives, thinking of what, what we might do that would be helpful in this area. And uh, we're very happy to say that we've come up with some really good ideas of how we can mobilize, how we can work from the family level to the, uh, the uh, neighborhood to national and international level, and how to mobilize both politically economically as well as advocacy uh, at, at the uh, lowest level or more grassroots level, low I mean in terms of the, the uh, communications uh, uh, paradigm that we have. So uh, we, we uh, have a lot of interesting ideas, but before uh, saying anything else, I would like to uh, ask our friend uh, and our guide, pres former president and chief of the chief of the elders, <laughs> Mary Robinson, to come and tell us all about climate. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. It's very nice to be back here myself. I've been here before, but not for quite some time in SIUS and in the John Hopkins, uh, Johns Hopkins University. Um, but it's particularly uh, good to be here with the Women's Learning Partnership. As Manaz has just said, um, we've spent the last two days uh, discussing how the Women's Learning Partnership might address the crisis that we're in because um, of the uh, climate change emergency. And uh, what struck me was the strength of the partnership because it's based on uh, a real partnership um, uh, paradigm. Um, the partners, the 20 partners who represent a number of different groups in their own countries um, have an independence and a capacity to think things through. And that was very evident uh, this morning when they broke into uh, small breakout sessions to discuss this in more detail and came back with so many ideas. Now, when you're faced with a kind of new uh, approach, very often you kind of say, oh, well, I'll think about it and I'll, you know, give me time. I need to go away and maybe think about it for quite some time. But no, there was a real willingness to step up. And I'm very pleased about that because I actually believe firmly that women's leadership is going to be needed more and more on this crisis. Um, I have a podcast called Mothers of Invention, and we have a somewhat challenging byline, which is that climate change is a man-made problem and requires a feminist solution. And uh, just in case there are some people who are a little uncomfortable in the room, um, may I explain that man-made, of course, is generic. It includes both men and women, and a feminist solution definitely includes men, and I hope all the men in the room and all the men uh, who may be listening, because that is the solution that we need to break away from the, uh, the way in which we're actually destroying our future. And I'm not exaggerating. Uh, climate change is worse than we think. It's happening more quickly than the scientists had predicted. But we have ways of countering it, and we know what needs to be done. And 
it's very timely that we speak about it at the moment because we're on the verge of the important year 2020 when we really have to step up and make a difference. I think I should say with some humility that I'm a relatively recent convert, if you like, to the uh, significance of the climate crisis. I missed it when I served for five years as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, I had a big job to do, worrying about human rights, gender, um, rights of people with disabilities, indigenous peoples, and there was another part of the UN which was dealing with climate change, the Climate Convention. And uh, we were in our silos. I didn't link across at all. It was only when I formed a small organization in 2003 to work in African countries on the rights that really matter if you don't have them, rights to food and safe water and health and education and shelter. And I became aware that um, climate change was completely undermining those rights, that uh, people didn't know how to predict um, the weather, um, and it wasn't um, just the kind of um, minor changes, it was changes that were completely outside the experience of communities. So the rainy seasons weren't coming as they should have come in countries like Liberia. Um, in Uganda, my friend Constance O'Kellett described the long period of drought and then the flash flooding that destroyed her village. And she had to bring her uh, women together to try and um, build resilience in the village. She's actually the first story in the book about climate justice. I know a number of you have picked up copies of the stories. There are actually 11 stories in the book and nine of them are about women fighting for their communities, but they're also two good men, and um, they try to illustrate and create an empathy for those who are in the front lines now, um, because very often we don't appreciate how severe it is for those on the front lines, whether it's small island states, whether it's indigenous communities, or whether it's just in very poor countries that are vulnerable uh, to uh, climate change. So, because I came to climate change through the lens of human rights and gender, um, it was natural for me to talk about climate justice. And when I formed my foundation on climate justice in 2010, it was still quite a, um, you know, almost a taboo subject. And, um, people weren't talking about it in those terms. And I'm very glad that that has changed and that it has become what the school children are marching about. Um, what young people are talking about when they um, call for change because they have you know, seen the other dimension of the injustice, which is the intergenerational injustice. Um, I was in the climate summit in New York in the General Assembly last September when Greta Thunberg spoke. And she spoke very angrily, really. She said, this isn't fair. You have stolen my childhood. And all you care about is business as usual. How dare you, she said. And she said it several times in the context of that speech. And it seems strange to have a child saying to the representatives of governments of the world, how dare you? How dare you not care about my future? I must say, I, I found there were tears in my eyes um, listening to her because um, she has that direct voice um, of youth, you know, the direct, unfiltered um, uh, challenge um, of uh, the injustice that she feels about um, her future and the future of her, all her contemporaries not being secure. So how do we move forward? How do we actually address this issue and address this crisis? I think we have to go back uh, to 2015, and I had the privilege of being the, sec the special envoy of the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon at the time, um, in 2014 and right up to after the Paris Agreement at the end of 2015. And so I was able to witness uh, messy negotiations that had taken place for the first of the big frameworks of 2015, the 2030 Agenda, as it's called, with its 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And I was glad to see a couple of other people in the room with the badge of the Sustainable Development Goals. It's a badge I like, actually, because um, it's the only badge in the UN I've ever really worn because it goes with everything, and it's quite nice. Um, um, and um, the negotiations for that um, uh, agenda uh, took two years, but you know, really finalized in September of 2015 with 193 countries agreeing 
which is pretty impressive. But the reason that they agreed was because they knew it was voluntary. So they could pick and choose how much they would do. So the package was agreed. And then we went forward to um, Decem December 2015, and I was even more focused because this was uh, the Paris Climate Agreement, and it was a treaty. And uh, as we got closer to it, the, the, the wording became weaker, except for one thing, and that was the pressure of small island states and indigenous peoples and the climate vulnerable forum of very poor countries working together and working with the crowd in the street in Paris. And some of you may remember the mantra in the street, 1.5 to stay alive, meaning we've got to stay at 1.5 degrees or small island states will go under and the impacts of storms and drought and flooding in vulnerable countries will be so extreme that um, they were pleading and their pleading was heard and we had a new goal articulated, which was that we would stay well below two degrees Celsius of warming above pre-industrial standards and we would work for 1.5 degrees. And I must say, I thought, and I think most people thought at that stage, this was for the small island states and the least developed countries and the indigenous peoples, a kind of, almost a sop to them. Yeah, yeah we've heard you, so we'll work for it. But without really a commitment. And that changed completely last, the October last year, when the Paris Climate Agreement actually had to ask the scientists to study what that goal meant and to tell us was there a big difference between staying at 1.5 degrees or going up to 2 degrees, and if we had to stay at 1.5 degrees, how would we do it? They were the questions that had never been studied by scientists because they'd kind of, oops, they'd kind of given up on 1.5 degrees. And so they sat together and they compiled their report. And it was a, a very clear and very stark report. And it did make an impact. What the scientists basically said was, yes, there is a big difference between 1.5, oops, go away. <laughs> 1.5 degrees and two degrees. Because in that band of time, bad things happen. The coral reefs will more or less disappear the Arctic ice will pretty well disappear. And the permafrost, and there's a great deal of permafrost, um, uh, especially near the Arctic, uh, will melt. And the, if, if the permafrost melts, it can throw up methane as well as carbon, which is much more serious. And so the scientists concluded after studying it that it was safer for the whole world to stay at 1.5. And we must work like mad for every inch we go above 1.5, if we do. In other words, it's vital that we understand that we need to stay, if possible, at uh, 1.5 degrees. It seems strange to be talking about this the day after the President of the United States has taken the formal step to withdraw this country from the Paris Climate Agreement. It, it is, to me, somewhat incredible that the President of the country that was leading on so many issues, even leading on climate. It was President Obama and President Xi who made sure we would have the Paris Climate Agreement by kind of matching each other with ambition. Not, not great ambition, but enough to get the Cl Paris Climate Agreement. And then to have, um, to have such um, incredible, uh, I, don't know, I don't know what the word is to describe how, um, how damaging it is that um, a president who knows very well, I believe, the damage he's doing, but in the short term, he's gaining from fossil fuel profits, and so are those in his, in his administration. I'm happy that many states and cities and business and philanthropy and civil society here in the United States are countering and are part of the coalition we are still in. And um, it, it's, it's good to see the ambition of states and cities, etc. but um, it, it is uh, almost incomprehensible um, that a president of the United States would be so irresponsible about an existential threat to our planet and to the future of young people and children in this country as well as around the world. And it has to be said from time to time. Um, so we have then the two big frameworks. One of them negotiated to be voluntary, the other, a treaty, but weak, 
except for the 1.5 degrees that we now understand. And um, there was a commitment of all countries before Paris to formulate their nationally determined contributions. And when the um, uh, um, nationally determined contributions, the NDCs, were added up um, uh, by the Secretariat of the UN and by um, Carbon Tracker and other bodies, um, they concluded that um, the, the ambition, if it was fully delivered, would leave the world at about 2.7 degrees Celsius of warming. Now, we haven't seen that commitment to full delivery. There's been quite a bit of slippage. So we're probably on course at the moment to closer to four degrees, which is catastrophic. But that's the course we're on at the moment. So um, what's the solution? Um, I believe that the important difference now is that the 2030 agenda that was voluntary when negotiated and the Paris Climate Agreement that was weak in its enforceability have both become imperative because of the scientific um, reports. Not just the 1.5 degree report, but last May we had the report on biodiversity. Uh, a short while ago we had a report on land use and forestry. More recently a report on oceans and sea level rise. Today, 11,000 scientists have issued a special report about the climate emergency, pleading with us to wake up and realize the emergency um, that we are in. So that is why 2020 is such an important year, because we have to bend that curve of emissions. Um, the scientists said in order to stay at 1.5 degrees um, uh, in, 20, um, uh, in the future, the um, uh, we would have to reduce by 45% carbon emissions between now and 2030. So that's why they said uh, in October last year, you have 12 years. Actually, we have 11 years and we're in November of that 11th year. So we're more into 10 years to 2030. And uh, carbon emissions went up in 2018. They will go up, I anticipate, in 2019. Um, and so we're not on track. Um, we need to have a commitment by all governments to commit to be carbon neutral, zero carbon by 2050. There are a number of countries that already have committed. It's the Carbon um, Neutral Coalition, the, the um, Coalition for Carbon Neutrality. And um, when I last looked, it was certainly over 20, maybe over 25 countries at this stage. But that's not nearly enough. And we want every country to start committing. More than 100 cities have committed to be part of that carbon neutrality coalition, um, some regions. And um, so there is a, a movement and um, a significant number of um, business leaders who are non-fossil fuel. Um, the business leaders that I work most closely with are the B team of business leaders, and they gave some leadership before Paris in um, Davos um, in January 2015. Uh, the B team of business leaders committed to be net zero carbon emissions by 2050, do it the climate justice way with just transition, meaning caring about workers in the oil, coal, gas, um, and uh, making sure that the transition was a fair and just one. So um, when the scientists um, issued their report in October last year, uh, they actually said it was doable, if you have the political will, doable to reduce by 45%. And I think that that political will has to come from a very broad movement for climate justice, basically. And I mean a movement that is both bottom-up and top-down. The bottom-up part is school children who are coming out on their Fridays for Future, young people, Extinction Rebellion or Sunrise or something as it's called, some of them in this country, um, uh, women leaders, faith leaders, union leaders, um, philanthropy, um, business, the business leaders who are non-fossil fuel, the we mean business that has committed to be net zero by 2050. And um, uh, the, the business and investment is more top-down than bottom-up, it can be very influential, especially the investment. If the investment refuses to be, to be risky 
about being investors in fossil fuel, if it listens to Mark Carney of the Bank of England and the, also um, the uh, governor of the Bank of, of, of France is saying the same thing and some other central bankers, um, that if you are too invested in fossil fuel, you're, you, you're at high risk that your investment is insecure because it may become stranded assets. And I was explaining that when I first heard that term, I couldn't understand what was meant by stranded assets. And I was told, think asbestos. Asbestos is a stranded asset. We don't use it because it's too dangerous. And fossil fuel over time, coal more quickly. Um, the Secretary General is saying no new coal plants by 20, after 2020. And coal needs to be phased out. Fossil fuel needs to be phased out. But we need a just orderly transition in particular um, to have regard to the workers. So what are the three steps that we should all take? Because we can't just leave this to governments and to business at a, at a, at a um, um, large corporate level, even though they are the main um, emitters. Um, we all have to take a responsibility. And I believe that if everyone could take these three steps, it would begin to make a difference in building that movement as well. And the first step is to make um, the climate crisis personal in your life. This is too serious to be left to others. Therefore, I'm going to do something I wasn't doing before. And that means something to reduce my own emissions. So I'm going to recycle more carefully, or I'm going to change my diet, eat less meat, whatever it may be, but something that is, is personal. And then that means you kind of own the issue a bit. You, you, you've a stake in it. You, you've done something yourself. And then the second step is to get angry and get active. Get angry with those with more responsibility, and that is the governments and the fossil fuel industry and agribusiness and others who aren't taking the steps that we need to be taking to bend that curve. And get active in supporting all of those who are trying to move in the right direction with conservation, um, with bringing clean energy to developing countries, and so on. Um, and then the third step, and I always say that this is the most important step, is we have to imagine this world that we need to be hurrying towards. We need to be making a huge step towards it in 11 years by getting to a 45% reduction in carbon. We're not going to do that unless we feel there's something in it for us. And what is there in it for us? There's a huge potential for this world because it will be a healthier world. It will be a world without the choking of fossil fuel. Look at the masks that are being handed out in Delhi at the moment. So the children, if they have to go out, out of doors, wear, wear masks. Um, but they're still suffering from asthma. They're suffering, and there are many, many deaths all over the world from um, fossil fuel. Think of the wildfires because of um, very often wrong agricultural practices, slash and burn, um, in order to provide for more um, beef and more um, soya beans or whatever to feed the cattle. So the whole thing is a cycle of um, what we need to change from. We need to change to more conservation, to actually uh, replenishing. Um, there's a drawdown project with very good ideas about how we can, in fact, um, re-forest um, and uh, compensate for the mistakes that we've made by regenerating as much as possible. And um, we also need to um, learn new habits. And this is why I think women's leadership is particularly significant, um, because we have to do what Wangari Maathai was ad adver um, advertising years and years ago when she was planting trees in Kenya and got the Nobel Prize for her work on peace and the environment. And she was talking about um, reduce, reuse, recycle. And um, th these are simple things. We all have to do them. They won't in, in their own way be enough, but nonetheless we have to do them. But we also have to put pressure as consumers on a lot of industry. We shouldn't have so much throwaway. Now, we have begun to deal with plastics, and we don't see so many single plastic bottles and things around. That's the beginning. But there's a lot of throwaway that we should um, change. We need slow cooking. We need slow fashion. We need um, to learn habits that I learned when I was growing up, because I'm old enough, I'm an elder after all, um, of you know, um, darning, um, fixing buttons, um, reusing hand-me-down clothes. There's nothing wrong with this. It's, it's actually perfectly good and perfectly livable with, and it doesn't use up the resources of the earth in the flagrant way we're doing most of the time um, at the moment. We have to get out of our flagrant uh, habits of overconsumption. 
part of the um, Sustainable Development Goals is to, to ad address and reduce our production and consumption. Uh, but all of this should be in the context of a good life and a, and a fairer life. And I think it will be fairer overall because if we're going to um, reach that target of reducing carbon emissions by 45%, then we're going to have had to implement the 2030 Agenda and to be much more ambitious about the Paris Climate Agreement. And implement the 2030 Agenda means leaving no one behind. It means getting the energy to developing countries so that they develop in a leapfrog way like they've done with the mobile phone into clean energy and not have to go into coal, oil, gas, um, which would aggravate um, the uh, vulnerability and indeed um, uh, make it impossible to achieve the 1.5 degree um, target. And I think the most important thing we have, and I'll conclude with this, is what that we have to have is we have to have hope because hope gives us the energy to work on things. The um, book on climate justice that I wrote has a byline, um, hope, resilience, and the fight for a sustainable future. And I learned a very deep lesson about hope from the then chair of the elders, um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Uh, we were together in New York um, about eight or nine years ago um, at a social good conference. And a social good conference involves young people who are supposed to be on their um, iPhones and their iPads because they're supposed to create a buzz of social media and we're supposed to be trending. Is that the right? You know, you know what I mean? <laughs> buzz. And um, Archbishop Tutu, when he's in front of young people, waves his arms and tells them he loves them and he you know, expresses himself. And we were being moderated by an American journalist who turned to Archbishop Tutu and said, said quite sharply, Archbishop Tutu, why are you such an optimist? And he looked at her and he shook his head and he said, oh no, dearie, I'm not an optimist. I'm a prisoner of hope. <laughs> and, you know, that phrase at the time really, as some of you have reacted, really struck me. And it struck me even more when you think about his life. You know, the chairing of that um, Commission on Justice and Peace, what he had to listen to, what, how he had to try and reconcile in that country at the time, having marched um, against apartheid over such a long number of years, and then to capture all of that as a prisoner of hope. And I think that's the most important thing, that we um, uh, make it clear to young people, we have listened to you. You are entitled to a future. You shouldn't have your childhood destroyed in the way that um, Greta Thunberg feels her childhood has been destroyed. Um, and we should be, as a human species, able to do what needs to be done because it is eminently doable. It is absolutely doable, and we can do it as prisoners of hope. Thank you very much. Well, I, I've just asked uh, uh, Mary to take a few minutes to take a few questions, and uh, and then we'll we'll hear her again later. But but uh, uh, please uh, welcome her back. <laughs> <laughs> and, and okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if there are any questions, <laughs> yes, there's one. Yes. But if you put up your hand again, yeah, yeah, put up your hand. Keep your hands up if you want the mics. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Could you just say who you are? Very interesting. Um, Peter from, um, well, the disunited kingdom, um, <laughs> as I'm sure you uh, probably feel. But uh, I just landed from uh, the UK yesterday um, and obviously landing on another flight. It's not great for climate. Mm. Um, important side blog about being a sustainable and uh, ecological uh, traveling, blogging type person as I want to live and work abroad. Um, well, in all the research and the studying I find, there's one thing that sticks out constantly, which is it's just an, an attitude adjustment that I think needs to happen. Um, I, I'm writing a piece at the moment on why our approach to the environment is all wrong. Um, I think that when we approach environmental change, we look at it from our relationship to it, when it should be about just keeping it for the environment itself. And that's why I love David Attenborough so much, because he's doing it about the Earth itself. It's not about mm. only how much we can extract from it. Mm. So my question to you principally is, what can we do to get 
a bigger attitude adjustment within politi politics particularly mm. and also amongst men because I think mm. most of my mm. men male friends mm. couldn't give a monkeys mm. um, and very wrongly so mm. uh, it's I, whenever I talk about it I'm coming across a sort of you know oh metrosexual and all these buzzwords you like to you know stereotype mm. with people mm. so um, yeah what you think mm. we can do thank you yeah it's an interesting point I mean um, I described the way I came to climate change as being through the lens of human rights and gender but it meant that I was focused a lot on people, which is not a bad you know, thing. But now I have deepened further. And I think a, a great deal about, I think holistically and even spiritually, about nature and about how we are connected. And I was lucky enough to be in Greenland um, over the summer and sit listening to a glacier calving and the noise of thunder and even sort of sound like diff distant gunfire at times with rifle shots going off as small calving happened. But but what was clear to me was that nature was stressed. Um, I was sitting in hot sun, um, about 14 or 15 degrees, um, blue sky everywhere, um, you know, hot by Irish standards. It had been 20 degrees in August, in um, July. This was in August of this year. And I, I, I communed with nature in a way I haven't done um, before, um, precisely because that's what it's all about. Um, we, we should understand that we are completely linked with the ecosystems that sustain us, with all the species that are part of this creation of the world, and that um, we're doing the wrong things. We are, um, uh, we are hurting this Mother Earth who should sustain us. I think um, it, it would be good if we can think about it more in those terms. And, and I think, as you said, David Attenborough and the films that he's making is bringing that home. I'm glad he used to do it um, with a kind of love of and joy in nature. Now he's telling the right story, which is that we're in crisis and it's our fault. And I, I love the way Kumi Naidu says quite often when I'm speaking on a panel with them or whatever, that um, you know, when we have made ourselves extinct, nature will recover. The world will go back to a pretty good state rather quickly because we won't be there spewing out our fossil fuel. Um, but you know, that's not, that's not being a prisoner of hope, is it? Um, so, um, uh, so, <laughs> so um, but, but still, I think, you know, I think the more we can um, be holistic, and we had a, lot, a very good discussion about that in the Women's Learning Partnership today, and I heard some really good responses along those lines. So I, 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 think, um, I think, again, I think you're right that women maybe can more easily um, address that, but also um, I, I, we need the men to say the least, oops, we just stop. <laughs> <laughs> now, there was another hand somewhere. Yes, okay. Okay. Hi. Hi, I'm Juliana Hitchcock. Um, I'm a senior at Pulso High School. And so, me and my friends here at our high school were involved. What, what, in what age are you? What grade? What age? Oh, age? I'm 18. 18. Yeah, yeah. sorry, because I don't understand American grades. Oh, oh, gotcha, yeah. I'm 18 <laughs> okay. last year in high school. Yeah. Um, and so at our school, we're involved with a club called the Girl Up Club, which is an affiliate of the Girl Up Organization of the United Nations. And so we are all very passionate about women's leadership, and we see how valuable it is. And so when you made a point about that, it really like hit home with me because I think it's very important as well. But I was wondering, what characteristics do you think women leaders have that are going to lead the fight for climate justice? And then also, what do you think just having more women hmm. leaders emerge will do hmm. overall to help climate justice? Yeah. Uh, really good questions. Um, you know, in brief, I think women are problem solvers, you know, fairly practical problem solvers. And uh, if we see a problem, uh, that is urgent and needs solving, then our approach to it is collaborative, um, you know, uh, working it out and, and, and trying to solve it together in a, in a collaborative way. Um, uh, um, you know, very often um, the, the structure is much less hierarchical than some of the structures that were male-created and male-dominated. There are a lot of men now who also have moved over to be, um, to take a more feminist approach, which is the one I'm describing. Um, it is extraordinarily important that women give leadership at the moment. Um, they, more and more women are in positions to do it, um, including, for example, heading up the International Monetary Fund, the uh, European Investment Bank, etc. They are the sort of women that have to now speak out strongly about shifting the investment from fossil fuel to clean, etc. 
And, but women at all levels can do it. And um, I, I was saying earlier to my um, Women's Learning Partnership uh, friends um, that you know, European women and American women, until recently, weren't giving the leadership that we need on climate change. Um, I would go to meetings, you know, be invited quite often, and um, the, the subject would be Me Too, violence against women, um, uh, equal pay, and then very sophisticated discussion about girls' education globally, um, health globally, and then climate without knowing what to say. But since that report last year, I am now a member of Fearless Women, Dangerous Women, Connected Women, <laughs> and would, um, all propping up, you know, and, and I mean, uh, obviously we have to connect at some stage, but the most important thing is that women are taking the leadership and feel that it's important to do so, you know. M maybe just one more question, there was one there, yes, with a scarf, and then I better get down out of here. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Erica, and I work with an organization called Youth for Human Rights International. What we do is we primarily focus on human rights education. So with your background, one of the things I'm really curious to get your take on it, obviously there's a lot to be done in the nature of climate change, and there's a lot to be done in the state of human rights, where we have to get people to be able mm. to treat people better in order to improve different aspects of humanity. But when it comes to you know, climate justice, you have people who don't realize that their actions that they take may affect someone in some village remotely and could be mm. literally life or death as far as, will I have food? Yeah. Will my crops be washed away? So I'm mm. curious to mm. how your background has led you to where you are today and how you feel human rights still plays an important role in this issue. Yeah. No, thank you again. Um, I, I love the question, and I could give you an awfully long answer, which I won't, um, uh, because it is, um, it's almost my life story. Um, it, you know, I, I, I've always had this kind of strong sense of justice about things, which led me to be a human rights lawyer, to take cases in the Irish court and in the European courts, sometimes against Ireland, on equal pay issues or homosexual, uh, homosexuality issues and other issues um, from an Irish context. And then when I became High Commissioner for Human Rights, I was looking in a different way at human rights and gender globally. And um, uh, as I said, I came to the climate issue um, from that lens of human rights and gender and focus on those most vulnerable and least responsible. And then this was very much widened by young people, by the children, the Fridays for Future, saying um, there's an intergenerational injustice. And I think it's good um, to keep that lens of human rights, gender, injustice um, in the climate discussion, because we are in a crisis, we are in an emergency, and it is affecting other people who are more vulnerable, poorer, more marginalized, um, more unaware of how to cope with less um, uh, capacity to be resilient, and yet they fight back, um, and they do what they can. And it's, you know, so it's, um, the, the, there's a great need for a better sense of justice in our world. And so, um, you know, I like the idea that you're um, going to follow that path, and I would encourage you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mary, and, and thank you for the questioners, which helped get some of Mary's story out, which she doesn't allow others to say. But uh, anyway, um, as you see, the, the idea of climate change is so holistic, covers so many different areas, the same way that our view of, of bringing about change in the condition of women uh, touches so many different, so, such a holistic and, and uh, comprehensive uh, set of issues. So they interconnect very closely. So now uh, I would like to um, uh, ask um, the, our panel uh, to uh, take their uh, seats. And uh, the chair of the panel is going to be Mosimbi Kanyaro, who is go uh, the uh, former uh, uh, leader of the Global Fund for Women. And she is uh, the, uh, one of the uh, foremost leaders of the global women's movement and uh, has been working in this field for many years. And now we're fortunate to have her as the chair of the board of the Women's Learning Partnership. So Musimbi, could you please uh, come? And then uh, Asma Khadar, Jacqueline Petange, and Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yes. yes. As you take your space on the, on, the, on the panel, I will start here. Good evening. Good evening. We would love to hear your voice. Good evening. Good evening. Wonderful. Um, as you've heard, my name is Musimbi Kanyoro, but my task this afternoon is um, an easy one because it's a, it's a task that is going to present the three panelists that you see sitting here. I wanted to say two things before I sit down and invite the panelists to talk. One is any global organization that exists but does not have roots on the ground really doesn't have, that is not global. Women's Learning Partnership is a global organization that is very rooted in places where change happens. Because change doesn't happen just in the sphere, in the air. Change happens to real people in real places. And the purpose of our panel is to bring to you some of the people that are actively involved in change making on the ground, working in the partnerships of Women's Learning Partnership, but also really responding to the issues that have been so well articulated to us by Honorable Mary Robinson. She has pointed out about the urgency of climate change and how all of us individually and collectively as communities should take the responsibility. And I do want to assure you that as a new incoming board member of the Women's Learning Partnership and chair of the board, this is an organization that realized long time ago the interconnection between what our sister somewhere there said, the connection between women's human rights and the climate justice and other issues. So I'm really delighted to introduce to you our three panelists who are going to help us see what it looks like on the ground. And I want to, to, to do so by saying there are three representing many others. And by just a, a way of assuring the presence of many others that came from various countries, May the participants in the partnership just stand so that you could be acknowledged. If you are a participant on the partnership, please stand and be acknowledged. <laughs> All of these leaders represent several countries, and had we got time, they would each be able to bring a story, uh, and the three will be representing all of them. So I'm pleased to include to, to introduce to you far on my right-hand side is Jacqueline Pitangu, who comes from Brazil. She is an accomplished activist in many ways, having herself founded an organization that is uh, um, uh, very active in Brazil. Jacqueline is a, a sociologist and a political scientist. She's a founder and director of Women's Learning Partnership of Brazil and she will be able probably to tell us something about how that works. And uh, I have known Jacqueline in many different aspects of the women's movement, including the fact that at one time she was a chair of the organization that I have been uh, that I just uh, moved away from, the Global Fund for Women. And so Jacqueline comes from Brazil, and she will be a voice from Brazil. Jacqueline was also, uh, had also a cabinet position in the government of, of Brazil um, and has also been on the National Council of Women's Rights uh, for many years in Brazil. So we get someone who sees how things work at government level as well as in the social movements level. Next to Jacqueline, again following, is Asma Kader. And Asma is uh, a human rights lawyer from Jordan and she's also the founder of uh, uh, Sisterhood is Global um, in Jordan. And uh, she is a <coughs> co-founder and a leader of many Jordanian and other Arab NGOs. She's a member of the Royal Commission of the Drafting of the Jordanian National Charter. Um, Hader is also, ha, uh, ha, has also served at government level, including being a minister of culture, uh, between the years of 2000 and 2005, 
and a Minister of State um, and the official spokesperson of the Jordanian government in 2013 and a member of the Jordanian Senate. So we also have a really experienced person from that country to be on the panel. And closest to me on, on the right is uh, yes. Joy Ngwake, who is from Nigeria, and she's the executive director uh, for the Center for Advancement and Development of Rights. Um, Joy is also the founder and the executive director for Women's Learning Partnership of Nigeria, and, um, for the, and uh, this works also for the advancement of uh, development rights. Um, her work as a social entrepreneur spans nearly two decades, during which she has worked on many different types of human rights, including women's rights, and worked with different types of organizations as a community activist and mobilizer and a researcher. And she has uh, published a lot in these areas of bringing the evidence for the things that we believe in. So the three panelists are going to uh, give us a window. <laughs> oh. Thank you, thank you. The three panelists are going to give us a window into what does it mean then to leave out this urgency of the climate change from the perspective of being grounded in some place. And so um, I will take my position <laughs> and begin. As and um, I'm asking okay. each one of you for the first round to take three minutes and talk about how you understand the urgency of climate change within the context of the country that you have come from, and specifically what it means for your part of the Women's Learning Partnership in your country. So let's begin with the uh, asthma. Okay. We are you'll be the first. Okay. Center Thank and then go sideways. Thank you. <laughs> Thank yes. you. In light of the very important speech that we listened to by uh, Mary Robinson and by Mahnaz. I just want to say that maybe it's important to make the link between family, gender, and climate change. And to say that as an organization which worked a lot since it was created 20 years ago on different topics related to equality and gender justice and, and power relation in the society, and was built on a mature uh, kind of uh, equal partnerships with the grassroots organizations in different uh, countries, 22 countries now. I think the linkages between climate change, family, and, and women's rights is very much reflect the type of our organization, of our partnership. Because we are not taking issues aside or apart from the whole comprehensive uh, uh, so, uh, relations in the society. We see that all women's, women's uh, issues are, uh, are the society's issues, and we see that all the society uh, issues are women issues as well. And to be frank, women discovered this practically, as one of our colleagues, colleagues from Pakistan uh, was telling us today, that when there is no electricity, women go and choose to, to use the uh, solar uh, uh, energy. And uh, in women in our countries are dealing with the challenges and problems to, to support their children with the heart that is full of love and will, very powerful political will to, uh, to save their families and to uh, serve their communities. The problem is that women were not given the power within the family to make decisions, within the com community also to be, to be part of the decisions as a feminist point of view, because there are some women here and there, but not necessarily always, they are looking to issues from gender perspective. And to be frank, for, for example, I will give you one example of, from Jordan. A Bedouin woman who had the chance to be trained on how to use the power of the sun 
in creating energy, clean energy. She went to India to have some, uh, some training on that topic with one of the organizations. And in India, she get all the knowledge needed to come back and to, te to teach and to, to, to help others to be uh, aware on how to use the, uh, the new uh, clean energy. The problem is when she left to India, her husband was not happy. He wanted to prevent her from going. And she was very much willing to go. And she went. When she came back and she became a star and famous for what she is doing in the country and everywhere, she was divorced. And her children was on her, uh, yani, she has to take care of her children. But she became a model for other women. Many women now are following her and doing the same. And she is able to raise her children. But there was a problem in the family because she, she tried to use her right to make decisions and to make choices. So we see there is uh, the problem of, of who is creating the climate change crisis, but who is also affected more than anybody else who are the children and women in the families and in the communities. That's why I think they are the most who feel and believe that they have to have solutions to the situation, and they can take the leadership to do so. So you are saying that uh, women take the leadership, but they still have hurdles. Of course, yes. That are right at the family level. Yeah. Let's hear from you, Joy, from Nigeria. What, ex <coughs> what example would you be able to yeah, um, give? Thank you, Miss Cindy. Mm -hmm. I'll start by, I'll ask us to first of us for Imagine a situation where a woman is fleeing from a conflict situation um, to a place where she's expected to find some level of safety, um, secure, and protection. And in that same place, she begins, she is faced with climate change, floods, excessive rains, and then she is displaced once again by natural disasters. And that's the story of many women in the northeastern region of Nigeria, where Boko Haram terrorist activities continue unabated. Women flee from one community to another. But there again, in the past five years or seven years, we've had unusual levels of rain. We've not had issues of like volcanoes and so on but there is unusual level of rainfall leading to massive floods, displacing large numbers of people in the community. And we look at how that affects women, specifically as homemakers, as they carry out their reproductive efforts. There are times women who are in labor to go, um, are in very high, much difficulty. They can't get to the nearest hospital to deliver their babies safely. Most of them have to be delivered, not even by what we call tra traditional, attend um, traditional birth attendants, just like that. Many have died as a result of that. And so that brings us to the issue of leadership. Women ought to be involved in leadership in every aspect, everything that affects them. If I'm affected by conflicts in particular ways, I should be involved in, in peace building processes, in preventing conflict. And if climate change affects me as a woman in specific ways, I should also be involved in making decisions regarding climate change. Because what happens, I don't want a situation where 50 years down the line, some people are waking up suddenly to say, oh yes, women ought to be involved in this decision, in these discussions. That has been the issue. In peace building, just recently that people came to the realization that yes, women are affected by conflict, and so they should be welcome to the uh, peace building processes. Let's not wait, wait till 50 years. As we begin this discussion on gender, family, climate justice, let's get women involved because women 
are peculiarly affected by these issues. Because in Nigeria, we talk about 35% um, affirmative action in leadership position, and we still don't have 35%. And this is a country that is led by, that has a population of about 50% uh, women. Why are we asking for 35% when 50% is more like it? So we are saying at this point, women should be part, women should be involved in decisions around climate justice, around discussions that pertain to climate um, change. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Jacqueline. Well, thank you very much. And um, as Mary just brilliant said, thank you, Mary. Um, I, I think being a Brazilian, I have to be a prisoner of hope more than ever. <laughs> Because uh, what's happening to my country, I think it's every day we are suffering, we are bleeding. Uh, the president, the newly elected, not, not so newly, already a month, year almost. This president said he had plans for the Amazon, mining and cattle, and soon the forest burns. And the forest burned because farmers burned the forest. That's, that's how the fires started in the Amazon. It's proved now. But this increase of fires, both spontaneous but also provoked, that are happening uh, and that are being controlled through an enormous effort from previous governments, they were announced by INPI, a very serious institute that with satellites monitors all the areas that are, are being deforest, deforestation in the Amazon. But the statistical scientific evidence was denied because you have now in my country a government that denies science. So that's why I say we have to be prisoners of hope, and we are. And that in dealing with this issue of uh, climate change and climate justice, I think that uh, what's happening in Brazil is a very clear example that we are dealing with power, and we are dealing with a political issue. And this goes from top to bottom from a local village, from farming, a family agriculture, to decisions that are taken at governmental level. But it's not only a Brazilian issue. Brazil is one of the countries that has uh, the largest and most important biodiversity and ecosystems in the world. And what happens there has an effect so I think we are dealing also with something that is transnational. We are dealing with something that is global. But then what is the response of governments like the US or Brazil? They claim sovereignty. They claim nationalism and sovereignty. And these are values that are very well accepted by part of the population. They know how to increase their constituents by saying, we have to defend our Amazon from all these northern interests that want to come here and occupy our land. So this idea of national identity, sovereignty, nationalism are very strong values that they are using. My government is using all the time. And uh, that were even uh, brought to the national, to the UN assembly. It was very interesting to see both Bolsonaro's and Trump speech, they were rooted on nationality, national sovereignty. So that's why I say we are on a stage of a very, very difficult political struggle, a transnational one. And I see with hope 
that uh, WLP will walk this path. I see with hope because we are a transnational coalition that work locally. So I think from our own identity, as Mahna said, this architecture that we have built might help us to navigate on very stormy waters, very, very difficult moment in very stormy waters. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you. So, while you're preparing to ask some of your, your questions, because I would like you to ask questions, I want to ask you, Joy, how do you mobilize communities and women to be active and engaged in the area of climate justice, gender justice, and also justice within the family. These are the three areas that uh, Women's Learning Partnership has spelled yes. out as important. We, um, WLP has um, several manuals. We have one on leadership, one on political participation, um, beyond equality, and so on. And these manuals are developed in such a way that it's very in engaging, inclusive, and um, encourages um, shared participation, participatory approach, and horizontal um, style of leadership. And so our trainings replicate this. What we do is we train trainers. We go to local communities, train people who now train others within the community, and we remain in touch with the train people we have trained who continue to give us feedback on what, while we continue to um, give um, technical support and so um, the past one year, we've organized um, up to three or four training or trainers on peace building, women, peace, and security. We uh, convert three of those trainings in Abuja. Um, that's the federal capital territory of Nigeria. And the target was to target uh, women in northeastern Nigeria. And so we selected organizations there and brought them to Abuja and trained them. They are currently replicating those trainings within. And so we have a network of women who are engaging in peace building processes just because of that trend. We do the same thing with leadership, with political participation, with um, advocacy for um, family law reform. And what does family law reform look like in Nigeria? Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear, <laughs> that's, that's a discussion that will take a whole day, yeah. but um, we, we are on it, but um, there are several laws in Nigeria that impact on how women experience violence even in homes, because we have a different set of laws for the northern region, another different set for the southern region, and many of these red, um, laws are not gender sensitive, Somehow they even give tacit support to um, violence against women in home. Customary court systems are, are practiced in the southern region of Nigeria. They court, the judges at these customary courts are not lawyers by training, as we have um, trained lawyers. These are people who are known as custodians of culture. And some of these cultures are obnoxious. They are gender discriminatory. Under this culture, you have issues of child custody, where the child belongs to the man, and where inheritance is denied women and, and girls, which brings us to the issue of male child preference. So every woman married, you can have eight children. If you do not have a male child, you've not even started, because you don't have access to the family land, um, land outside of if you don't have sons. So these are the laws that we are having to grapple with. Yes. I know as my as a human rights lawyer, and also laws are very specific to countries. Can you give us a, 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 um, an entry into what laws are protective or not protective for women in the Jordanian context? Well, I have to say that, of course, there are uh, ongoing development based on the struggle that women movement, human rights movement are leading and our partnership as Women Learning Partnership Jordan. Also as a coalition fight for uh, amendments in the family laws and in the penal codes and many other laws. Still there is the problem of, of the gap between the text of the law and the implementation. 
the legal illiteracy problem that is most of the of women who need these laws, they don't know them or they don't know how to use them. So this is also part of our mission to, to allow women and educate them about their rights and how to use it. But still, for example, they used to say that uh, family laws are the God will. It is the religious laws. But if we look carefully, we can see that family laws for Muslims or non-Muslims were developed and changed and amended through the years. So if it is the God word, for example, why there is this space of amending and developing these laws? Lately, there was a big struggle on the early and forced marriages issue because the, uh, a woman who is not married before need her uh, guardian uh, man the permission to marry. And she can marry in the age of 15 mm -hmm. uh, if she had the permission between 15 and 18. The problem is that the percentage of marriages for this age is around 10, 10% of the total number of, of marriages every year, which is too much. That means 10,000 women yearly are out of school and they cannot continue their education in the, to the secondary school, while the constitution in Jordan is very clear that uh, secondary education to, to the age of 16 is compulsory and free. But there are 10, at least 10,000 girls who are not on the, on the seats of, uh, of education. So we can see that it is very complicated. There are still a lot of points where, for example, polygamy is still working, uh, while some countries like Tunisia, for example, based on the same religious Islam, were able to find that the text is not allowing polygamy. So you can see that interpretation sometimes is giving different views and different based on the power relation in the society. So we believe as partnership and as activists in Jordan and in the region that the struggle should continue to, to, com to complete the amendments needed to have equal relation within the family. The study that was done by WLP and partners shows that the problems that women are suffering is not coming from a spe specific culture or specific religious. That there are gaps in the family laws around the world in, from different, different uh, backgrounds. Still, that means that it is true. The problem is the power relation and the patriarchy and the weakness of our movement that need to be strengthening more. And we need more women to be educated and more, more women to be aware about their rights and to work toward it. Lately, last year, there was a huge achievement mm -hmm. in terms of uh, penal code, which was also the causes of the gender-based violence in the society. So we do have now new uh, text of, of law that was uh, passed through the parliament uh, mm -hmm. as a result of a big campaign that women NGOs and our organization was part, main part of it to abolish Article 308, which was allowing the perpetrator of sexual crimes to marry the victim and go free, for example. And this was abolished totally. There was also a very light sentences given to the person who killed his female relative because of uh, cleaning the honor of the family. Also, this one was abolished totally. No more tolerant with these kind of crimes. So we can see that achievements is happening. But if I tell you that we start working on these issues 40 years ago or 30 years ago, maybe that time, if we were talking about it, people will say, well, it is impossible to achieve. It takes time and it took uh, much time, but it happened by the end of, of, of the struggle. So I think we, we should continue to make the laws as a text with no discrimination at all, and then to make sure that they are able to be implemented. And we all believe that it is all connected. We need women to be free and independent economically so they can use the laws for their, uh, for their rights. Otherwise, they don't have choices. They know that they have right to divorce, but they don't know what to do after divorce. Like there is lack of jobs. They are not educated enough. They, they don't have resources. The, the courts are not 
giving them enough money for their children, all of these problems. Very practical, but I think the movement will make it, uh, uh, in my uh, opinion, uh, possible to, to be solved. And the state should take more responsibility toward these problems because women's safety and rights are not a, a private uh, family issue. It is also the responsibility of the state. I think both of you have illustrated quite clearly that if women don't get, if we don't pay attention right from the very early age and what happens at family, women are not going to be able to lead in other areas such as climate justice. The interconnection mm -hmm. being shown is really important. Mm -hmm. In Brazil and in many countries of Central America and even elsewhere, the question of attention to the indigenous knowledge and indigenous uh, people is very important. And um, uh, Jacqueline, can you give us some interpretation of what you have been working with and thinking in regards to indigenous people in Brazil or elsewhere in the world? Yes, uh, it's a good question because indigenous peoples, they are guardians of uh, nature. Uh, they have this harmony and this holistic relationship that uh, uh, Mary was mentioning uh, naturally. It's their way of living, it's their way of communicating. And uh, we have in Brazil very different uh, indigenous tribes, uh, some of them in the Amazon, uh, many of these tribes, they are not uh, Brazilian. For instance, the Yanomanis, who live uh, in the north of the Amazon on the frontier with Venezuela. I have recently been there uh, for a work with a refugee and migrant women from Venezuela. But these uh, groups, like the Yanomani, they, don't, they are not Brazilians or Venezuelans, they transit. They are people of the forest. They transit on the forest. But you also have a traditional communities in the forest that are not indigenous people. Um, some of them have become world-known environmentalists like Chico Mendes who work the, the rubber trees. So it is uh, a, a lab, you would say, of harmony between uh, humans and nature that you find there that keep biodiversity and that keep nature. Uh, and uh, this uh, really is being threatened now uh, by uh, a number of, uh, let's say, values of uh, uh, agro-business, cattle raising, mining, and uh, this, I would say, more global perspective of how to use nature for yourself that is present in so many societies. So I think that there's a lot to learn from these communities. And just making one point on relation to women, I would say in these communities, both men and women, play a key role, but throughout history, it is women who have, I would say, even be more responsible for the survival of humanity because we take care of families, of children, of grandchildren. And I think that uh, in this sense, women have a key role to play. Thank you. We have five minutes. What question might you have? And for those questions, for We'll see with the micro. One, two, and then we'll come to you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth, and I'm part of uh, the SITES Global Women, uh, Global Women Lead here. Um, and we are a collection of multiple students from a variety of concentrations uh, who all have an interest in climate change. So we've decided to have our annual conference on gender and climate change as well. It's a very uh, in-demand subject. Um, and so listening to how um, Ms. Robinson described in the UN there were silos and not necessarily um, collaboration on climate change issues initially, I'm interested in whether you believe this is still an issue today uh, where climate change has been siloed 
or uh, wh what your experience with collaboration on climate change, gender issues uh, is like today. We'll go ahead and have three questions and then we'll ask for responses. Yes, yours was the next one. Okay. okay. Go ahead and ask and then he will ask and we'll have the All three right, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to phrase my question. It has to do with trying to link a number of things that you said, but particularly looking at Northeastern Nigeria as an example. Because I was struck when you said, you know, the women you were working with are in the Boko Haram area. And I guess my concern is about how we can link stories so that we can see the totality of the issues. Because, you know, when Boko Haram was in the news, and it's, you know, as ebbs and flows, they're no longer sexy, something else has replaced them. But the, 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 um, the issue of them being an arm of ISIS and all that political dimension was highlighted. But nobody really spoke about, first of all, the meaning, Boko Haram, that is the nationalist aspect of, um, you know, the, the seemingly anti-Western mm -hmm. embedded in the title. Mm -hmm. But more importantly for me, in an area that is now an area of flash floods, when I was a little girl, Lake Chad was the largest lake in Africa. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it was huge. Today, if you look at a map, you can't find Lake Chad. That is to say, the link that we need to make between our activities that have, dis that have disappeared a lake mm -hmm. and therefore destroyed the livelihood and the culture mm -hmm. and everything else of the peoples around mm -hmm. that lake that has created the kind of vacuum that makes the kind of activity of Boko Haram possible. And all those things are treated as separate stories. And I guess my question is, in our interventions of leadership training and so on, can we have strategies where those links become clear and therefore the res the responsibilities for knowledge mobilization, resource mobilization, and how to return water to Lake Chad, I don't know. I mean, can be, can be make, made more clear. Mm -hmm. And the last one here. Yes. My question has to do with, um, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, one of the panelists mentioned transnational organizations like Women's Leadership, Women's Learning Partnership. And you know, another trans sort of national or association would be BRIC, right? Brazil, Russia, India, China. It's an, an economic relationship. And it includes some of the leading, you know, polluters and contributors to carbon emissions in the world. And, and you know, when one talks about being a prisoner of hope, one wonders how, how one can hope and continue to take your small actions in your home and in your community when these, these monstrous um, economies are, are, are prospering and, and, and preaching and prospering at the same time. So what I'm wondering is whether we can achieve 1.5 with just on tra parallel tracks, mm -hmm. one track being this our small actions, small island states and small people wherever we are in the world doing our, contrib making our contributions to reducing the ecological footprint, while at the same time just having to sort of close our eyes to this, this reality that's in front of us, these, these, these economies that won't really uh, pursue, on at least on a national level, each one, um, uh, that goal of carbon neutral. I mean, those 2025 states yeah. don't include these nations, right? So how do you get to the point where these nations will yeah. also join on to those 20 or 25 mm -hmm. that uh, Mary yeah. mentioned earlier, you know, that are have committed to the carbon? So there's a number yeah. of questions I just want to ask yeah. you to think about. They are very related into micro, micro. Yes. So I think you, you will naturally take the Boko Haram one. And oh, let's go, you can one. take one each of these. Yeah, please. I'll take the yeah. one for, yeah. Those linkages are actually made often during our workshops because 
the trainings are, are organized in such a way that participants share a lot. You never know what will come out at each training because we give every participant, we tell them this is a safe space, discuss what you want. So during the Peace and Building, um, security, Women, Peace and Security project, we got a lot of information on climate change. That's when we heard about the, um, the issue of flooding that is further displacing people who are already internally displaced. And then another connection you can make, which might be on the negative, uh, is, is that the Boko Haram people are known to be resident in a forest, a very thick forest, Sambisa forest. And there's been talks about how to level that forest in order to um, get rid of them that way. So somehow the linkages are there whenever we have this one. But some of these outcomes might not be like what, if the government goes ahead or gets people to help them to level that forest, that's, that's like contrary to what we will want to happen as a result of this issue. But that might happen eventually. Yes, the linkages are there. And then the um, manuals. We have manuals on leadership. We have one on political participation. But we, we adapt them while training. We adapt them to suit a particular context, to our context. We adapt them to suit a particular group of participants so that all of these things come out. And because participants are coming with various um, kinds of experience, and they share because they are given the opportunity to share. And analysis are continually made. I don't know if that answers your question <laughs> somehow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Would you like to? Well, I would like to respond to the question about the new development in the relation between climate change, gender, and family, and all the issues. I think you are right, there is some new trends. We can see easily that more and more women, such as our partnership and organization, uh, organizations in this partnership, we discover the link between climate change issues and uh, women's rights issues. And we are making efforts to develop e even our work through the new ideas that was created today and yesterday to have a more intensive program that is focusing on, on this issue. But we understand, and this may be related to, to, to the questions here, that it is, it is an issue that are, we need to be united. It's our lives, it's our future, it's our children's future. It's the risk of not being able to enjoy anything, any rights. If the climate change risk and crisis continue to be there and has no power behind it, no, no defenders, to defend the earth and def defend the, the, uh, the right of people to live in a clean and green and safe uh, uh, planet. I do believe that we need to, to be creative in making the link between our rights and the powers who are attacking these rights. And here I think, yes, we know that there are powers in the world who are really not care. They just want to make more money and to be يعني, satisfied themselves despite of the fact that they are damaging all the rest of the world or even their, their own people. What we think is very possible to happen is that we as peoples of the world need to be united and working together and developing strategies and ways to put pressure, enough pressure, that these powers are not anymore free to do whatever they want and they are responsible and we can get them accountable for what they are doing. This needs a new, I think, a new approach of not political organization, but at, at least uh, human beings' uh, uh, efforts, joint efforts, to make sure that um, there is a strong and powerful uh, um, population around the world who see and believe that things should be changed. And the risk of uh, the, the heat is, is stopped. And this is not a choice. At least 
we are now knowing that there is no choice to, to, to leave this issue aside and go ahead with our programs, normal yeah. programs. It's not the, yeah. it's not normal anymore. It is really a very emergency situation that we cannot just uh, close our eyes and, and uh, leave it going on just because big powers are over our ability. No, they are not. Yeah, in a way you've answered almost. Well, do you want to say anything quite quickly? Very quickly, I will just uh, talk about uh, yeah. the idea of collaboration in links yeah. and the BRICS very quickly. Um, first, uh, I think that uh, uh, we could say that the agenda of climate uh, justice uh, cuts, it's transversal. It cuts across. It doesn't matter if you're dealing with development or you're dealing with human rights or you're dealing with uh, women's rights. It cuts across. So it should be embraced by all and we should create a front not only uh, these groups that traditionally worked with environment and climate, but it cuts across our agenda. And secondly, I think that the, uh, the BRICS, it's very interesting in the architecture of international power, a new group that emerged. But within the BRICS, I would say that Brazil was the country that was more environmentally uh, uh, let's say, protected and sustainable. So when I say that I have to be prisoner of hope, it's because there was a lot of achievements in Brazil in terms of environmental protection, uh, in gas emissions, et cetera, et cetera. And this is now being destroyed. And this is why I think that uh, the BRICS is not maybe the best scenario, but it should be taken to the UN or something like that. Mary, you were quoted quite a lot. Do you have a, yeah, a comment? I might um, add to what Asma was saying in answering the question uh, about, um, you know, are we going to have two parallel tracks where we do our best, but also there are the, the bad emitters that continue. Um, we have to disrupt. That's the truth of it. And we have to... <laughs> and disruption takes a lot of forms. Litigation is a particularly good disruption, and we're actually seeing more and more attempts at litigation. We had the successful Dutch case, the Urgenda case, that got the Dutch government to be much more ambitious about reducing its emissions. Um, there are cases pending before courts in this country and in different countries around the world. Um, some of them against the emitters, um, companies, some of them against governments for not protecting people enough. And we're going to see more and more of that. We see the disruption of um, uh, the, um, uh, you know, the people who are making peaceful protests now, Extinction Rebellion and others. Um, I think they need to be very careful to make sure that people are on their side because it's a, you know, if, they, if they disrupt in a way that alienates people, it, it could be self-defeating. But um, still, they, they're, they're committed enough to uh, have that kind of... It's like, it's like apartheid where people came out and marched and peacefully protest protested, and it's as serious as that, so it's understandable. And then there's the disruption, which I think is quite effective, of shareholders raising things at meetings. Um, more and more now, we need shareholders to start doing that. And I mentioned the investment side. You know, if investors disrupt by no longer funding fossil fuel, that will move the needle. So, I mean, what we need governments to do is to put a price on fossil fuel, not to have subsidies for fossil fuel, to do all the things, the policy things that they should do as part of getting to zero carbon. But if they won't do it voluntarily, they have to be disrupted. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So as, as we go, one of the things that Mary uh, challenged us to do was to make commitments and to make them personal. So I'm going to ambush you a little bit by ambushing myself as well. Um, what, which area, and you don't have to be specific, might you think of just one word, no speech, might you want to make a change in? I want to make a change on how I think about clothing and fashion and ask myself in what way am I actually contributing to the injustice in climate change. So that's what... I have ambushed myself by having to say it before you. What about you, Sal? I think also food, closing, yes. Okay. <laughs> I think we have to make decisions 
by ourselves to stop using plastic, for example, mm -hmm. or also to make sure that we are using uh, our properties to the, to the maximum we can and just not throwing things for, for nothing, and to work hard as organization to, have, to allow space for women and young people and girls to be involved in, in this movement and to understand in depth how they can disturb <laughs> their powers. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's about you, not I like the organization to <laughs> recycle things I use from clothing yeah. to other yeah. things, even disposable, to use them until um, they can't be used anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. And I hope you do the same. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Musimbi and uh, uh, Joe, Jacqueline, and Asma. This was wonderful. Uh, now we are going to have our Lifelines program, uh, moderated and designed uh, by Abena Busia. Uh, Abena is a very special person. She's a scholar, uh, she is a professor. She, is, uh, she was the director of women's studies at Rutgers. Uh, she still is, of course, connected with Rutgers University. But uh, more than all, uh, she is uh, right now a diplomat. Uh, she is the ambassador of Ghana to Brazil and to basically all of Latin America, as well as being a fantastic, many times published, recognized poet. So Abena, could you come and... Uh, begin lifelines, uh, the poetry of human rights. Thank you. Good evening. Before I call my poets up, I would like to introduce the one person this evening who has not been introduced because she was too modest to introduce herself. You have just heard from Mahnas Afkami. <laughs> the founder and president of the Women's Learning Partnership. <laughs> she's been acting as MC all afternoon, but I thought you should all know who she is and rather than figure it out by process of elimination. Um, Magnaz served as the former Secretary General of the Women's Organization of Iran. She was the first woman from that region to serve as a Minister for Women's Affairs. She a, was a professor of literature and is a great lover of, of poetry. I'm very grateful to Mahnaz because it's because of her passion for poetry and dance that I'm a member of the board. I always say I have the best position on the board because I was invited just to organize poetry readings twice a year. And that's what I'm doing on the board of, women's, of the Women's Learning Partnership. Um, Mahnaz is very, a very distinguished and beloved woman who has, there's a brief biography of her, but of course for some of us the most important thing she's done was to bring all of us together under the umbrella of the Women's Learning Partnership. And so now to Lifelines. Um, it is an integral part of the work of the Women's Learning Partnership to remind us all of the importance of the humanities and poetry in all of our policy making. And so we, every time we meet, we do this. And I have the privilege and honor of trying to find poets once or twice a year to share their work on the poetry of human rights. I have to say a special thank you to this, this evening to the three poets who have joined us this evening because it's the first lifelines life I've organized where I didn't know any of the poets before they got begging letters from me to come and read. I usually know one person who then invites the others. But this year has been very strange and I also have to thank one of our constant friends who's read for us a couple of times, Elizabeth Lara, for introducing me to Indran Amir Tanyagam, um, who then introduced me to the other two poets, because we've been trying to, we had challenges in terms of time and date and so on, 
And so I didn't know, wasn't sure of the date. And by the time we knew the date, we had very little time and I was traveling around four continents. So these three people have been receiving strange messages from me, literally from four continents over the last four weeks to try and pull this together. So I will introduce them and they will come up as I introduce them so that you know who they are because they will be introduced only once. Um, as I said, our first um, poet who helped me find the others is Indran Amirtanyagam. Indran is, please come up as I call your name from whichever side you best can. Um, Indran is a Sri Lankan born poet who I'm very jealous about because he writes in English, Spanish, French, Portuguese and Haitian Creole, and he really does. I can't read all of them, but I've seen them. Um, <laughs> um, he has published 16 poetry collections, including the just released Coconuts on Mars, amongst other things. He also has a collection of po poems on civil war, which tells the story of his home, the civil war in Sri Lanka. In addition to all of that, he's also a diplomat working at the State Department. Please welcome him. Our second poet, Sarah Cahill Marin, is a Virginian porn poet currently living in Washington, DC. I have to say, that was one of the qualifications. They got a letter saying, are you going to be around Washington? Can you please join us? Um, she's the author of the recently published Reasons for the Long Tomb. And her work has been published in literary magazines and journals around the country. And you can tell her youth by the last line of her biography, which says you can follow her on Instagram and Twitter. <laughs> Please welcome Susan. And finally, Terence Patrick Winch, who's originally from the Bronx, the son of Irish immigrants, He's the author of eight poetry collections, the most recent of which is The Known Universe. He is a multiple award winner, including the Columbia Book Award and the American Book Award. He's written two short story collections, and his work is published, as you can read, in more than 40 different anthologies. Terence is also a musician and a songwriter with a recording history as long as his poetic writing history. And he's the now retired head of publications of the Smithsonian National Museum of American India for many years. Thank you all for being here. Now this is the way we do lifelines. And again, I have to thank our poets for something because usually we sit over wine or something and reach the decisions about the poems we are having and the order in which we're reading them. But as this was not possible, they've all very kindly accepted my diktats on how this is going to go today. Because of we are the poetry for, for, for human rights, and also because we always read as part of the Women's Learning Partnership meetings, I try to curate our, theme, our poems around themes of human rights, including what we happen to be discussing. Um, so this evening we will be putting our poems in, we put our poems in conversation around these themes. So we read not, indiv not individually, serially, but we read our poems in groups. So I will introduce each group of four as we get to them and then, um, up, we will read our individual poems, and then I will introduce the next group. So the first group is on the question, is poetry really of displacement, or poetry that deals with different forms of alienation, and how we can, in our writings and in our lives, try to resolve them. The order in which this section goes is I will read first, followed by Sarah, followed by Terence, followed by Indran. And 
As with most poets, all poems have stories. If there's a poem with a story behind it, they will introduce the individual poem as they read them, because some of them do have very interesting stories. All my friends are exiles. Born in one place, we live in another, and with true sophistication, rendezvous in most surprising places where you would never expect to find us. Between us, we people the world with a plum and a command of languages. We stride across continents with the self-assurance of those who know with absolute certainty where they come from. With the globe at our command, we have everywhere to go but home. Hello all. This poem is applying for EBT in California. Uh, I'll give a short foundation for it. It's a cross between being homeless in a state and also having money and walking in Manhattan with a job uh, to the theme of alienation, those two feelings. Lovely and lonely, we who are desperate, who wander nowhere, no arias and no diamonds, no class and no conversation. We are the vagabonds stealing cheese and figs from the jacketed and the adorned, sipping private champagne and snubbing our public living. We who cannot come inside, your glass castles high above the avenues, throw rocks that burst into petals, hitting the glass, and we laugh and dance in the street at the cellist playing in the park. For us who are free from the castle, we without walls and we without silk pillows and strangling starched collars, we the tearless laugh because we cannot weep. Well, thank you for inviting me, Avina. Um, it's a pleasure and privilege to be here. Uh, this is a poem called Return Engagement. And I have a lot of uh, immigrant friends in this country and elsewhere. And I think this poem kind of came out of conversations with some of the sorts of realities and obstacles that uh, people have to deal with as they um, try to find a place for themselves in, in this country anyway called Return Engagement. I will come back someday. I will break down the gate. You must have a passport and a letter from your sponsor. The embassy must vouch for you. You cannot look like a caveman or a homicidal maniac. You should be able to do electrical and carpentry work. You have to remember all your professors. You must memorize everything they taught you. All your expired baptismal certificates and official papers must pass inspection. Your dead must swear to support you. Your ex-lovers must want to sleep with you still. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read a poem, a new poem um, written uh, for Neil Silberblatt, who who is about to undergo a surgical procedure. And, and thinking of Natalia Aravena Contreras, a young Chilean woman who, whose right eye was damaged uh, by a, a bomb, uh, a bomb lacrime, you know, a, a tear gas bomb. For Neil and Natalia, the spot on the liver will be excised by an expert hand, and friends and family are praying the cutting will be complete and remove all trace of the cancer. 
So much depends, Neil, on this. Voices of poetry as well. 10,000 now in the group gathering, hands clasped, thoughts wrapped about that spot hovering above the surgeon's hands. While you wait for surgery, a young woman in Chile, Natalia Aravena Contreras, her right eye gouged by a tear gas bomb flung at close range into her face, lies down at her parents' home with a faint hope that the eye will recover. Her dad has written an open letter to the president asking why an unarmed woman walking to the gathering place of the crowd was attacked with flagrant cruelty before even arriving at the protest site. Neil, there are two patients on my mind, two sadnesses, two sets of prayers and hopes for recovery. I know you would visit that young woman and hold her hand and say, God, give her a chance to get up again and see with both her eyes the future of her country. You too, my friend, may you get up and walk ahead with fierce urgency, saying no to bastards, to tear gas, cancer, hopelessness. Thank you. Our second group was put together thinking of the intimacy of engagements that we have to deal with as children, as lovers, as family members, as intimate friends. Our first reader will be Terence, reading the proclamation from my father in 1965. I will then follow with a poem I wrote for my mother, followed by Indran's Coconut on Mars and Sarah's Crumbling Walls. Okay. Uh, Abena mentioned that I worked at the National Museum of the American Indian for a long time. And while I was there, I would be given various writing and uh, editing assignments by our director. And one day he came up to me and he said, uh, you have to write a proclamation for a, a colleague who was retiring. And I said, then what's that? And he said, you know, the whereas, 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 therefore, you know. And I said, oh. So I wrote it and then I thought, why not, you know, uh, steal this form for a poem. And at the time I had, I had, um, stumbled upon an old, uh, really minimal journal that my father kept. And uh, so this poem is in his voice. He came here, uh, my mother was from County Galway and had a pretty simple story and she came here in the 20s. My father was the uh, son of an Irish woman and a German father. Um, and during World War I, the Brits that they were living in in England, the Brits locked up all their Germans and put them, uh, including waiters, which my grandfather was, and put them on the Isle of Man for many years. So my my father's mother took her eight kids back to Ireland. So my father was raised and educated in uh, County Mayo, actually, Madam President, <laughs> and um, became eventually the custodian of the. Catholic grade school across the street from our building in the Bronx. So this is in his voice. Proclamation from my father in 1965. Whereas time has caught up with me and the boiler broken down again and day after day it snows and snows and there I am with my shovel in the dark cold night waiting for day and wishing I was in New Jersey with Ethel and PJ and Marion and having a drink and taking in a play maybe later eating oysters at the oyster bar and dancing until four at the United Irish Counties Ball. Whereas I am now 60 years old and don't feel so good much of the time like right now, while fat Father Hammer just turned 50 and I know is getting set to fire me. But I've been here for 15 years and I'm ready to go my own way into the secret America I never knew before, the banjo playing lesbians the depressed school teachers who tell me, Patty, 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 you're our man. 
Whereas I feel it all coming apart, the hard years in this country, the loves gained and lost, the tough jobs, the gigs, the booze, the dearly departed friends, the wife whose absence never ends, while I never mend, always sensing the ghost so near. The thing you fear most in life all, all boils down to your own invisibility, there for all to see. Therefore, be it resolved that tomorrow will be 80 degrees and sunny. My children will visit me. My grandchildren will sing me songs. The Bronx will float on the clean, sweet air of paradise. I will feed a basement full of cats. The future sprawls out like a drunk on a bed. Thanks. I sometimes dream of my poems in series. I've lived many places in my life. I was born in Ghana, raised in Holland and Mexico and England. I've spent more decades than I care to admit living off exit nine of the New Jersey Turnpike. And I am planning this series of poems on my different addresses. This is the first one, so far the only one, which shows you how slow I am because it was written back in 1994. <laughs> it was a 70th birthday present from my mother, who is a gardener, and it is about the home in which we grew up. I grew up in a wonderful little country village in the Windrush Valley, 13 miles outside of Oxford, which I guess, like most childhood homes, remains pristine in one's imagination. Addresses, 93 Abingdon Road, 1963, which is when we moved, to 1993, which is when we finally sold the house. The road home has always passed through the crossroads by the Hind's Head at Kingston Bag Pews where the A420 snakes across the A415, our Abingdon Road. Turn right at the apple farm and go straight for three miles. At the first mile, look west at the top of the hill before the sharp descent. From late autumn, when the trees are bare, the low hills of the Windrush Valley huddle towards you in the distance. At the second mile, where the Windrush finally meets the Thames, summer brings competing crowds to either side of the old Roman bridge. In the Maybush, locals, anglers and farmers fiercely guard their privacy against the outside visitors holiday makers, society diners, and boating Thames travelers reveling at the Rose Revived. I'm sure you, if you haven't gathered it, all those names are the names of British pubs. There were more pubs than anything else in our little village. The third mile begins with the Stanlake Garage, the same family, Alfred, Roger, Peter, and now Pauline, have owned it all these years. It ends with the historic Golden Balls, a pub under the sign of the pawnbroker. That changed hands once too often and now stands boarded up, abandoned. But if you reach there, turn back. You have passed our house by half a mile. It looks like all the others except the quiet wildness of the garden mother planted, all alone. Her midwife hands first birthed babies, then nursed seedlings, tamed shrubberies, and planted every single living tree on this patch of earth to which we are entitled. And except for the name on the wrought iron gate which marks our difference, da to sleep and ponder 
which we have done in this place of sojourn for 30 years now. We arrived in mid-December winter in time to greet the heaviest snowfall of the century. Four foot high snowdrifts dwarfed us as we played our way to school in the only winter weather of my life I recollect as fun. And so it is that wherever in the world I am, I return to this road, to this ancient village full of children, and this aging house shrouded by still blossoming things in anticipation of the refuge of one warm, one more wondrous, one more Windrush Valley Spring. Um, coconuts on Mars. I have left by other languages to sit in the troughs of their foreign pens, snorting beautiful and strange cries, to be visited someday when I have gathered the force again to leap beyond the white cliffs, to crash into the sea between island and old continent. But I forget my birth under a coconut tree, I forget, too, that I found fan-tailed palm trees when I visited Cornwall. You can imagine the perplexed grin I sported that weekend, the sun warming my skin at St. Ives as we walked among those English palms. I did not find the King Coconut agreed, but a cousin, a relation. We are all blood coursing through veins, each white and red cell identical in shape and substance, no matter the different clothes and names and histories we sport on our bodies, in our heads. I am rich in cells, and some are dividing still. Turmeric stops the decline. Persistence, repetition of sums, writing certainly, the ever-present chance of discovery, the blue canopied forest, a finch unlike any other, you, my dear, reading these lines. I can see through every glass in my mind. In short, let us not build any frontiers, as there are no strangers. In short, I compose this meditation in English, but anticipate a translating tool will transform my words into every other language on the planet. Ah, what a silly fantasy. As I write, the last speaker of a tribe in the Amazon forest will die. As I write, the trapped finch will bleed from the wire and lie down to die. As I write, a coconut tree will grow in an open-air hothouse on the Cornish coast. As I write, 6,000 loaves will sprout and 60,000 fish fly from one loaf, one fish, in the hands of a miracle maker. As I write, my fingers will rest, no need to type, my voice will guide the keys. As I write, I imagine the young Thambili, sweet water coconut, taste you to drink, will be served outside the hothouse. As I write, scowl and sadness will turn to smiles and hoorays. That was a grand thirst quencher, my dear Cornish scientist. Congratulations to engineering survival. Let us raise our glasses. Thank you. I think one of the themes that I really loved in some of the questions that were asked in the last panel were, what's the solution? Is it big or small? And for me, at least in, at this phase in my life, the, the answer is small communities telling stories, because I'm a storyteller. And this poem is a story that someone trusted me with, and it's called The Crumbling Wall. 
One. Mother kept chickens once in coops beyond the yard, penned like hedges to one another. She made us still their huevos in the morning dawn. Fresh laid, they sold well in the markets, and you were just young. Nothing to do, nowhere to go. Now, tanks full of city fish sound like rain on the tin roof of mother's house in Guatemala, sneaking into abuelita's bed, listening to the world breathe before she died in the cardamom fields. Remember? Two. When the sun turned the streets to dust fields, faraway friends laughing, wild and ferociously, you bring the match from mother's stove and light the tail from the captured cat on fire. Watch it burn. Sneakers scuff gravel, kicking stones away like so many tolls collected on the way north. There's barely room to piss in the trunk. Remember? Smelling skin in the noon dust, Hair and dirt, you cough, but laugh hard to see that you're smiling. Three, tropical nights roll like tides, spraying gentle rains and soft, tender breezes from the mountains to chickaman chattering, chortles of parroting sprees, tiny monarchs of the canopy singing, semiotic chains, rhizomatic rhythms of a nomadic system buried deep without time. Water falls thick, wetting air inside smells of mother's layered fruit cake, pieces of white bread, zapatos, these zapatos, all juices running together into the sweet, sweet night. Four. Desert cold floods criminals in mourning as the wrong bus honks, passes by. Wide faced windows, two glaring headlights, eyes in the dark dawn. Police probing through murky sewers and city streets, looking for you. Above ground rats race into the phallic chute and sit, dogs waiting a command. Immigrant, flick open a silver flame, light a dirty dollar, identified by no place at all, smoking squalor, Arizona's borders burn, raging. <laughs> no, I just want to say that this last section is our acknowledgement to the question of, the cli of climate justice. It's our poems on e our ecological footprints. And the first reader will be Indran's reading a bucolic return. I will then read two poems by somebody else, by Craig Santos Perez, and I'll explain why followed by Terence reading two poems, and then Sarah will read a wonderful, I think, fitting conclusion about the mountains who could care less about us. So, Indran, thank you. You know, poetry is infectious, and so <laughs> I was keen to get back on and get off the stage quickly <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> Um, a bucolic return. Um, I've had the luck of living in different countries throughout the world and, and uh, living uh, in natural environments of all sorts, in, in cities that um, are like um, jungles for me. Um, I remember in Mexico, the, the Zona Rosa became a, uh, filled with animals from India when, in one evening as I walked through it. Anyway, this poem is called A Bucolic Return. Rabbit, bat, opossum, groundhog. These are residents of my garden house, and they will be accounted for, given proper due in my erstwhile urban poetry. So sit back and enjoy the bucolic turn. Office worker, become older and gardener, allowing grass, weeds, and wild flowers to grow plants seeded by birds, 
acquiring an English sense of land, wilderness snipped with subtlety, a country feel, agricultural hue, lest I forget I lived once in Vancouver, not far from Stanley Park, the odd black bear bounding out. Central Park, where rats the size of cats peered from nooks in the rocks and scampered through strawberry fields at night. And now Washington, D.C., where in my waking dreams squirrels turn into voles and from my dwellings in West Africa and South America, more exotic rodents still, Aguti Capybara. Thank you. One of the wonderful things about curating this series is you have to look for poets. And I was looking for poems about the earth and found a poet I'd never heard of and clearly should have. He's from Guam, teaches at the University of Hawaii, Craig Santos Perez, who has a series on poems, love poems in the age of climate change. Sonnet number 17. I don't love you as if you were rare earth metals diamonds, or reserves of crude oil that propagate war. I love you as one loves most vulnerable things, urgently, between the habitat and its loss. I love you as the seed that doesn't sprout, but carries the heritage of our roots secured within a vault. And thanks to your love, the organic taste that ripens from the fruit lives sweetly on my tongue. I love you without knowing how or when the world will end. I love you naturally without pesticides or pills. I love you like this because we won't survive any other way except in this form in which humans and nature are kin, so close that your emissions of carbon are mine, so close that your sea rises with my heat. Okay, a short poem and then an even shorter poem. Uh, test results. I pity the rocks and rivers as I drink my coffee morning on the beach. My heart goes out to the ocean, all of which is now contained in the bucket I'm carrying. I am here to console the sun, our old yellow friend, now a stick of butter melting on the stove. I extend my condolences to the stars, devoid of all their spark, stuffed into jam jars. The trees are barking in the ashtray, their branches broken, leaves all scattered. The dark snuffs out all that mattered once, the big house, the sailboat, the burnt old man. In the sterilized room of the clinic, they draw my blood, red as valley fire. And then another poem that I just see now also mentions blood, but you chose these. So. <laughs> this is called Breath. Good is a footnote in the book of evil. Blood is an ocean trapped in a straw. Love is a minor deity in the pantheon of chaos. There is no tomorrow in all of history. The most beautiful word of all is air. Thanks. just stuck on that last line, <laughs> just resonating. This is called, My Mountains Could Care Less About You. And it's not my mountains. It's, uh, it's as if Mother Earth had written us a letter. My mountains could care less about you, steel structures clinging, 
tendrils rising, curling like fingers desperate, lonely, clutching, dry and desolate. You've buried basements and pools, trying, like only the hairless do, to stay cool, as if heat is a thing you can hide from. There's no road between my breasts. Tremble at the sight, at the tracing of lines, at the endless rising, rising, billowing, blooming hills, blanketed Madrian sky islands, ranges, tectonic, tumbling scenes of the Sierra Madre. Pine oaks peeking out, ancient, alpine, mountain islands in my desert sea. My arid desert to grasslands, cradles, Huachuca, Pinaleño, Santa Catalina, peaks you've named with your expiring words, cached red spills of mercury, tinted dirt, hemmed edges of tan, yellow, gray, 13 square patches of green choking on dust. From 34,000 feet, think of me as a woman pores leaking salt, exerted, worked, and squeezed, ridged and wild, bodied peaks climbing and falling and wrinkling over years, water traversing and tumbling back into the sea. I am the desert Hera, sucking you dry, absorbing your waterless body into hers, remanding you who come to harvest, to marvel, to take, back to the metal coffins you built, to ground from which they were mined. For nothing you build here belongs here. For nothing we build here belongs here. If only we remember that. We're not quite finished. We have a special treat. No? Oh, please. Oh. I won't argue with my mothers. I was taught not to argue with my mothers. Okay. <laughs> um. Then I, will, I, then I will read one last poem, which I was going to read at the beginning and didn't. Um, so I'll, re I'll end with the poem that I cut out in the interests of time, if I can find it. Um, it is a poem about the... Oh, I left it there. It's not in this. It's a poem I'm attached to because it's really about the conditions, the many conditions of our lives. And um, I mentioned it yesterday to a friend. It's a poem called Migrations, which was inspired by the opening paragraph of an article by my friend Homi Baba. He wasn't a friend at the time. He was a stranger I was terrified of. But it was the day I met him and we became friends. Um, I heard him give the lecture um, on which his very central, important essay, Dissemination, was based. And the poem is taken from the opening paragraph of that lecture. So the poem is dedicated for Homi because I changed his words. But it contains what I call, the reason I love it, because it contains a migrating line. Because in that opening paragraph, Homi Baba quotes um, a line which contains the word after the last sky. And it was, after the last sky was a title of a book by Edward Said. But Edward Said had taken that title from a poem. Well, so exile is important, because here I am, 
an exiled academic born in Ghana, raised in England, living in New Jersey, on leave at UCLA, where I hear this lecture given by an exiled Indian living in England, visiting UCLA, who quotes a line by the exiled Palestinian who lives in New York, whose book he had read back home in Bombay, and that title is a line from the exiled Palestinian poet writing in Paris, <laughs> who Said then read in New York, and Baba quoted in LA, and I wrote the poem in Accra. Um, we have lived that moment of the scattering of the people, immigrant, migrant, emigrant, exile. Where do the birds gather? That in other nations, other lives, other places has become the gathering of last warriors on lost frontiers. The gathering of lost refugees on lasting border camps. The gathering of the indentured on the sidewalks of strange cities the gathering of emigres on the margins of foreign cultures. Immigrate, migrate, emigrate, exile, where do the birds fly? In the half-life, half-light of alien tongues, in the uncanny fluency of the other's language, we relive the past in rituals of revival, unraveling memories in slow time, gathering the present, immigrant, migrant, emigrant, exile. Where do the birds fly after the last sky? Thank you all for being here. We'll see you in March in New York. <laughs>